Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 198 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at some of the anti-EV FUD and what the truth is behind a lot of these statements. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I want you to let you know that the Roundtable episode is recorded and in the can. A great discussion with the still-secret guests, so look out for that in a couple of weeks. Now, our main topic of discussion today is FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Episode one of this podcast was called Myths and Legends, and it addressed some of the prevailing thoughts around electric vehicles at that time, early 2019. Uh, We covered things like, your battery will die in three years and need replacing, and you can't drive or charge your car in the rain. In episode 68, we covered a lot of the more up-to-date pieces of fear, uncertainty, and doubt that have arisen since then in an episode called Myths and Legends, The Sequel. In the intervening years, there appears to have been quite a concerted effort from some segments of society, mainly pushed by fossil fuel lobbyists, to muddy the waters when it comes to electric vehicle adoption. The number of articles written which make claims about electric vehicles, charging, heat pumps, etc., seems to be climbing on a daily basis. So much so, in fact, that the Fully Charged Show and Fair Charge UK have joined forces to provide experts who can go into various media channels and debunk a lot of these claims, and we'll talk more about that later. But it is something of an uphill battle. A typical example of this is the recent fires on the container ship and at Luton Airport car park. Social media were all over these, claiming they were caused by EVs, when in both cases, This turned out to not be the case. You'll also see people posting videos of vehicles ablaze, which are quite clearly not electric, and saying, look what your electric car will do to you. There's even a video taken in Russia several years ago of a truck containing LPG canisters exploding. And the number of people who blindly accept the fact that this was an electric vehicle is staggering. On this very podcast, Dean Hedger from Vital EV told us of the time he parked his car and two guys walked past him with a curry saying, thanks for not parking your Tesla next to mine. Those EVs burst into flames, mate. So crap like this is making a difference to public perception. Now I want to bring in Claire Cullen and Quentin Wilson now to talk a little bit about how we can get that debunked information out. Quentin needs no introduction, although if you've been living under a rock for the last few years, you might not know that he heads Fair Charge UK, which is an EV campaign group aiming to make the EV transition more understood accessible and affordable, and to push the government to drive the energy transition forward. And Claire, tell me what your role is for people who may not be familiar. Good morning, Gary. So yes, I am um, head of Stop Burning Stuff, which is, uh, as all my friends tell me, a very intriguing title. I uh, head up an initiative which is to do with uh, fact-checking misinformation on electric vehicles and clean energy. We will talk about that a lot over the coming few minutes, but um, I like to ask everyone who's new to the podcast what their EV origin story is. How did you get involved in all this? Oh, it's uh, it's <laughs> a long and short story. So uh, in actual fact, I was one of the first e- mini E pioneers back in 2010. That was my first foray into electric vehicles. I was part of the trial for six months. I had a, a mini E to test out how it went. I think it had a a range of something ridiculous, like about apparently 80 miles, but I think it was probably more like 60. Uh, And my nearest charger was about 80 miles away. So yeah, it was interesting times. Since then, I have spent a little time working with Fully Charged, um, supporting them on the events marketing side of things. And when this opportunity came up, Dan Caesar got in touch and said, we think you'd be a great person to help us launch this campaign and um, work with the likes of Quentin, which I'm very much enjoying, to get the truth out there on on, uh, electric vehicles and clean energy. And that brings me nicely onto my first 
question, which is we're, we're here to talk about misinformation. So, Claire, give me some sort of indication of what we describe as misinformation. Is it just people getting their facts wrong? It's a very good question. So I think there's a little bit of that going on. I think that actually it, it's bigger than that. So we have seen misinformation around electric vehicles and and so on for probably the last decade or so since they started. But this year in particular, it's really ramped up. It's reached a peak and we are in no doubt that uh, it's a more organised campaign against electric vehicles. There's a lot of negativity in the press. Some of that is misinformed journalists, but I think some of that is also a bit of clickbait journalism going on. And also there are some people with vested interests in slowing the transition to electrification. So uh, we're definitely seeing a real peak in negative news stories of electric vehicles, myths flying about that, that just aren't true. And uh, I think uh, Quentin, Robert Llewellyn, Dan, Caesar uh, sat together and said, look, we need to do something about this. We need a coordinated approach to start addressing some of this misinformation because it is influencing consumers. They, you know, it's it's building this fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and it is slowing our transition to a to cleaner technologies. Now, Quentin, I tend to look at this through the lens of the old adage of first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, and then they fight you, and then then you win. And I think we're at the then they fight you stage. Do you agree? I mean, what's the scale of this? I, I do agree, Gary. We we are at the fight stage, but I think this is you know something that no society's ever done before. This this huge energy transition. So you can't kind of compare it to anything, and you can't be complacent or or, or, or blind about it. Claire's right in the sense that there are vested interests pushing really really hard against this. And if you look at the 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 the, the, the stuff that happened at COP twenty eight about you know such a pushback from the UAE and 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 Russia and everybody in OPEC about that wording. You can see that they really are worried. And if, if that manifests itself in such a public arena, just imagine what they're doing underneath the radar. So there's vested interests, trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars worth of vested interests that are, that are pushing back. And the, the, the worry for me is that this misinformation, these myths, these inaccuracies are really, really now firmly embedded. I can reveal to your listeners, Gary, exclusively today, a piece of research that was uh, embargoed and, and, and has been released today from uh, Electrify Research. And they did samples of uh, a thousand people in the UK, Germany, France, and the USA, all, all potential car buyers, and asked them questions. And here's, here's the first one. Mass adoption of EV swaps one problem, pollution, carbon dioxide from oil and gas with another, lithium and cobalt mining, dead batteries. Now, 60% in the UK agreed with that, 65% in Germany, 64% in France, 60 in the USA. Now, it, lots of surveys have been done saying that, you know, that the, the, the carbon, embedded carbon in, a, in an EV and the mining of the batteries, you know, it, it goes after, you know, 10 to 12,000 miles. And, and that's really, really well documented. But the idea that it, it's as, as polluting as, as, as mining and, and refining and drilling for fossil fuels is nuts. Batteries from EVs make a serious serious fire hazard. Um, 46% in UK, 72% in Germany, 54% in France, 53% in the USA. So that fire story's gone, if you'll pardon the pun, you know, blazing on. And and, and we know, you know, in the UK alone, 100,000 vehicle fires every year, uh, 243 EV fires last year. So, you know, it's a 0.0. 4% incidents of having a fire in an EV compared to combustion cars. I mean, you know, so this sort of thing is really, really embedded. I mean, the tire wear story, which has come out of nowhere and hasn't been, hasn't been audited or, 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 you know, peer reviewed or anything, but this, this, this idea that EVs, because they're heavier, have greater tire wear and this, this plume of particulates is coming, coming from them as they drive along, microplastics in the environment, 37% of people in the UK agreed that they were um, a, a danger to, to the environment, 37 in Germany, 34 in France, 35 in the USA. So these myths, which just start, as Claire said, as a, as a kind of piece of misinformation picked up by a journalist and then 
and then uh, you know amplified and amplified have gone on to be firmly embedded in in the social consciousnesses of all these countries and that's what's so worrying because it is as claire said going to destabilize the transition it is as we know slowing sales i've been sort of following on from that you and i went and were at a conference last week and you stood up and you told everybody there i made a note of this misinfo will derail the ev transition if we let it now at the time I thought maybe you were over egging the pudding a little bit for the audience, but I learned only this morning that an Osprey Charger Hub banning application in Grantham was refused last Friday. Various reasons were given, but one of them was a councillor who stood up in the meeting and said, those EVs will catch fire like they did at Luton Airport. And that's just a case in point to back up what you were saying, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was in a taxi in London yesterday. And the taxi driver, we talked about EVs, and he said, of course, you know, the, the, the Luton fire was caused by an EV. I said, no, it wasn't. It was a diesel Range Rover. He said, I know. I've read that. It's a cover-up. Um, and you just think, whoa, where does this come from? We've seen a picture of the Range Rover Sport diesel burning in the car park, surrounded by fire extinguishers. It's clearly the first car because it's not parked in a bay. It's just been abandoned in, in, in one of the, the access points. Um, and it, it's really clear, it, it, how many times do you have to say this? But it's kind of, we've got an ideological hatred of EVs by certain segments that are really kind of amplifying this again and again and again. And when, you know, people like councillors and MPs and politicians read this stuff and it influences their behaviour and their votes, it's really, really worrying. Now, I want to come back in a few moments and talk about some of the things that you said relating to those influences behind the scenes from Tufton Street who are, who are influencing some of the media. But before I do that, let me just bring Claire back in. Claire, talk to me about some of the efforts that are being put in place to combat misinformation at, at stop burning stuff. Like who's on the team, for example? Absolutely. So we have uh, a great team of experts who are working behind the scenes to address a lot of this mis misinformation. So obviously we have Quentin, um, who is, uh, I would say, our lead spokesperson for Stop Burning Stuff, an amazing level of experience and uh, knowledge on the sector. So we're very, very pleased to have Quentin with us. Um, we've also got Robert Llewellyn, who... Um, has been uh, heading up Fully Charged for the past 14 years, as founder of Fully Charged, I should say, and Dan Caesar, CEO, um, who's incredibly knowledgeable on the sector and also on the um, clean energy side of things as well. We are working with Dr. Ewan McTurk, who's an electrical chemical engineer and is our battery expert. Um, and in actual fact, he's just done an incredible podcast that was launched yesterday uh, which is all about myth busting on um, batteries and battery technology, which I have to say is very welcome because the uh, amount of um, misunderstanding, I would say, on battery technology is astounding. We're working with Lorna McAteer from National Grid, and she's our energy expert, um, and also Colin Walker as well from um, the ECIU. So we've got a number of experts there. We've also got a number of experts who are behind the scenes as well that we can call them who are subject matter experts um, who are helping us with the data, putting together the facts and helping us share those. Do you have specific examples of places where the team has been mobile, mobilised to provide some updated information? Yes. So I, one person I should really mention, and I apologise for not mentioning him, is uh, Ben Kilby, who is our PR and communications expert. And he has been doing an incredible job working with publications to ensure that they have the right information. And in actual fact, um, very recently, he's been working with The Guardian. So The Guardian have just launched about three weeks ago, a short series of EV Mythbusters with Jasper Jolly. And they are publishing factual information on um, anything from will EVs catch fire, they're more likely to catch fire, of course they're not, to uh, information around material mining for batteries and so on. So I think Ben has been doing an incredible job with the media to try and address some of the things that are going out and actually put out the facts. I mean, I think I've been reading those articles on the, in The Guardian. They're, they're fantastic. And uh, Quentin, you and I have talked about this before because a lot of what Stop Burning Stuff are, are doing, excellent though it is, 
he's very reactive. An article gets published with some bad, inaccurate, or just plain wrong information. And if it gets some widespread coverage, such as the Luton Airport car park fire, stop burning stuff shifts into high gear and puts out the truth about it. The, the way I see the, the Colin Walker, Jasper Jolly Guardian thing is you're, you're starting to become a little bit more proactive in that, uh, that aspect. Are there anything else or is there anything else happening along those lines, bringing out more proactive work? Yeah. I mean, we, we firmly believe, and Ben is a great uh, protagonist in this, to actually build relations with, 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 with journalists. We have a situation, bizarre though it is, Gary, that the, these journalists write these stories because the editor tells them they're good for clickbait in, a, in an era where advertising for newspapers is, is severely down and they want to keep um, readers on, on, on the page. So they write these stories without knowing about electric cars or having driven them or owned them. And inevitably, they look a bit foolish when we come around and say, actually, you know, that's wrong. And we, we did this with The Guardian and they were really good and really noble and said, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll publish a fact-checking piece just to show you that, you know, we, we are listening. And that has then gone on to the, the, the series of articles by Jasper that, that Claire was talking about. So we're, we're having, you know, regular conversations with the Mail and the Express and, and having lunch with journalists and saying, look, we're here to help. We don't want you to make yourself look foolish. Just ring us up and ask, is this true? And we'll tell you yes or no, completely independently. And that's a kind of, you know, a much gentler process of, 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 of preempting things to make sure eventually that, you know, you are called upon to, to, to accurately verify stuff, which people find on the internet or, or, or on social media, which, which is largely you know, largely wrong. And I'm, I'm really interested in this story you mentioned, Gary, about the, the counsellor. And if, you know, offline, we can have a conversation about that so I can get in touch with the council concerned and say, look here, this is an issue. You, you just have to keep, it's like whack-a-mole, really. You, you just have to keep fighting this stuff because we're at this, this stage where it's so important that we, we clean our urban air, that we have energy security, that we have cheaper energy for all via renewables. And, and we've got this really small coven of people who are trying to destabilize it. And, and you saw in the, the Z mandate wrote it, vote in the House of Commons the other day, 397 MPs voted for it and 39 MPs voted against it. And that just shows you actually how small these, these minorities are. They're, 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 they're vocal, they're, they're, they're extremely noisy, they're extremely aggressive. But actually, when you get down to the numbers, they're, they're tiny. And I get really you know, depressed sometimes when I turn the phone on in the morning and there is just another anti-EV story. You know, one newspaper ran 196 continuous days of anti-EV stories. And you just look at it and you say, why? So, so, so understanding that, that that is not a representative section of the community and, and that most right thinking people actually do want cheaper running costs for their car, cleaner air for their children. They don't want to be buying petrol and diesel and, and, and polluting and then they want to do their bit for the environment. And we, we kind of cling on to that, like this life raft in this, this, this sea of, of, of misinformation, but it's, it's a big job. That's for sure. And how much, uh, I'll sort of address this to Claire, but Quinton will probably have a, a thought on it. How much of the work that you're doing is involving the lobbying aspect? Because Quentin mentioned there the, um, the ZEV mandate. How much of the work you're doing is speaking to politicians and going in and say, look, these are the facts. This is what you should be voting for. Let me jump, jump in here. Um, I, I and, and, and Ben are regularly in, in the Houses of Parliament and we have a, a, an all-party parliamentary group on EVs, which is really, really good. Um, uh, so, so you, you get, well, let, let, let me give you an example. I mean, a, a couple of weeks ago, we, we took in the CEO of Moto, a lovely man who was complaining to me that, you know, he can't get the, the charges for his, his sites, you know, the ultra high speed charges, and it's two years to get a grid connection. And we said, look, this is, this is completely nuts. Um, and we took him into the, the, the APPG and, and, and got, you know, a large group of MPs and, and peers from the House of Lords. And he told them that, uh, you know, I, I, I put the plan permission in for, for, for these charges and the planner said, no, look, there's shrubbery here 
Um, and and it's going to be environmentally damaging if you if you put these charges here and move that shrubbery. So we deny the the planning permission. So and 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 Lord Burt, you know the, the, the ex BBC uh, Director General John Burt, was there and his jaw just hit the floor and saying this is absolutely absurd. So he's going to ask a question in in the House of Lords about this. So. You can do this, uh, 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 and, and it's really important that MPs understand the technology and understand the barriers and the constraints that are facing this whole electrification. So the answer to the question, Gary, is yes, we we, we do a lot of this. And things like, oh, what did I hear the other day? A, a letter from an MP to a constituent who said, you know, that combustion engines are much more efficient than than electric motors. And that's why he's always going to be driving a, a combustion car. When, when the exact opposite is the, is the case that a combustion engine loses seventy percent of its power before that power gets to the rear wheels, where with an electric motor the torque is instant and the, the power loss is, is is marginal. So that's what you you are fighting against. It's the same. It's a microcosm of what's happening outside in social media. That obviously MPs read, pick it up, and then they, they they'll ask these questions in the House of Commons, which which are sadly wrong. So. Yeah, it, it, it's something we do a lot of. Mm, I think it's exactly that. I think the politicians also suffer from the same thing as everybody else is suffering from. You read things in the newspapers and you think, okay, well, that that's likely to be fact then. And it isn't always the case. So that's why we're very keen to address what's going out there in the first place to make sure that everybody sees the truth. And I think this is a unique situation. I, I, in my lifetime, I've never experienced something like this before where there is a combination of of deliberate mischievous misinformation being created by vested interests and then also uh, a large group of people who are amplifying this misinformation again and again and again on 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 social media so it becomes almost factual uh, and it it, it it i think it's really unique and i've i've never seen it before but i guess if you look at it we shouldn't be surprised when you look at what what disruption this is this is going to cause and how many how many jobs and how much indus- industrial change is is necessary? So, you know, we're not at the end of this road yet by by any means. Now, again, you and I have had this discussion, Quentin. I was in the, at the London TV show recently, and a Daily Telegraph journalist interrupted me and uh, sort of barged in and started talking. And I said, "Let me stop you there. Let me ask you a question." Why are you printing so many anti EV stories? And he said, "The reason we do that is because that's what our readers want." And I think it was you who told me this last week, a new analysis by Smog has revealed that The Telegraph has published a significant amount of anti-green content in its opinion pieces. And over 85% of the 171 opinion pieces uh, reviewed were identified as anti-green. Talk to me a little bit about the the Telegraph, their anti-green agenda and their links back to some of the uh, the folks in Tufton Street. So... Um- Dismog did a really, really good piece. And, you know, if anybody listening is interested, you know, connect with dsmog.com or .co.uk and, 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 and subscribe and, and support them. They, they, they really are very good investigative journalists when it comes to, to climate change. Um, but the, the work they did showed a clear line um, of those, those articles written by people who were either trustees or worked with um, the Net Zero Scrutiny Group, which is a, a group in in a Parliament who doesn't believe in climate change and is trying to tell us all that the Net Zero is a complete con and a complete hoax. But Net Zero Scrutiny, Scrutiny Group is also connected to the Global Warming Policy Foundation, which is a Tufton Street think tank, uh, right 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 wing, uh, that again is 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 climate skeptic. And then if you look at the funding that comes into, into that group, it goes all the way back to billionaire fossil fuel interests in, in America. <clears throat> so there, there are fairly clear lines there where, you know, the, the, there's, there's fossil fuel money influencing the debate in the UK through a national newspaper. And then when you, when you look that the Telegraph might be financed or owned by a, a, a Saudi sovereign um, wealth fund, you kind of think, all right, you know, th- th- can, can this really be independent journalism? And when you've got that level of, of attacks on climate change and net zero and environmentalism, you just wonder, you know, why is this happening? Is it because they think their readers want it or is there a darker, a darker reason to this? 
the whole thing about the tele, Daily Telegraph, obviously, is it's a broadsheet. So you'd think, well, let's go down and have a look at some of the tabloids. And then you get the, the Daily Mails of the world. Do you think that they've got the same thing going on or are they just reacting to what they think the, the public want to hear? Is there some kind of linking back to, you know, either Tufton Street or the equivalent for publications like the Daily Mail? I don't think there's a, 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 a conspiracy here. I think it's just as simple that, you know, it's a small, small world. Everybody reads each other's newspapers and they see these stories and, and they, they think, okay, we'll, we'll run it too. And then it, again, it gets amplified and amplified. One story appears in the Telegraph, which is then amplified by the Mail, which is amplified by the Express, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got this self-fulfilling circle of, of, of misinformation and, and, and that's how it works. And I mean, to say this is what our readers want how do you know this? You know, they're writing in to say, give us more anti-EV stories. The readers click on them and that, that, that gets them, you know, the, 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 the clickbait numbers. I remember talking to uh, somebody who, I won't name now, who, who, who did that famous column about the, the Jaguar I-Pace and uh, handing it back because it didn't work because he hadn't got a charge box and had to charge it off an extension cord in his front garden. And, and he said that he got 7,000 comments on, on, on the column that he wrote. Um, and the editor sort of said, that's great. You know, it's most column comments we've had for, for, for a long, long time. So you can just see the way it works, that it is, it's all about getting eyeballs and getting clicks. Which is frightening because I also believe that that same journalist who talked about how bad they are has since gone and bought another electric vehicle. Am I right? Yeah, he's got an i3. Yeah, BMW i3. And he likes electric cars, but, you know, it was a great story. And, you know, I think he was slightly embarrassed when I, I said this to him. And he, look, look, he's, he's a great journalist. I'm a great admirer. He does some, some really fine work. But it's just an opportunity for someone to write a column or a piece that goes with this flow of, you know, we all hate electric cars. And I think I'm, I'm really struggling why people have this ideological hatred of electric cars. Is it because... You know, people in 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 Polonex and Oakley sunglasses drive Teslas and are seen as smug, liberal, uh, uh, left left wing people, or or is it just this resistance to change? What why are people so against electric cars? I I just don't understand. But the 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 the, the vituperative, almost visceral, cellular hatred is really amazing to see sometimes. I think it's all of the above. You know, there's, there's influence from third parties. There's people don't like change. There's the perception of what an EV driver is. I think it, it all works in there. And I think that's one of the problems. If there was one underlying cause that you could target, it would be a lot easier to try and target that cause and say, right, if we can solve this, there'll be a, a, a much bigger uptake for electric vehicles. But because it's, it's spread across so many different uh, underlying factors, it becomes, as you say, it's a little bit like whack-a-mole. Uh, you solve one problem here and another one comes up there. Uh, can I loop back to the lobbying and the discussions that you're having with the members of parliament? Now, if they're getting a lot of their information from the, the Telegraph and some of the broadsheets or the Daily Mail and things like that, what's the education process that, that you're going through to say, you know, what you're hearing, what you're reading here is crap, whereas the reality is that, you know, the cars don't automatically burst in, into flames and tire wear is not as bad as it, uh, as it's made out. What's, what sort of education is, is happening? Are you doing that in the session or are you taking them offline or is stop burning stuff playing into that in some way, shape or form? It, it's very difficult because we can't go through with MPs each, each point, you know, they're not experts in everything and they're not really supposed to be. But I think there is an incumbent obligation for them to check information before they, they, they mention it in the House of Commons or, or write about it or even repeat it. Um, but maybe then I'm just an idealist. Um, I, nobody's taught me this stuff. I've, I've had to find it all out myself and find out about how batteries work and, and, and go on courses and, 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 and read it up and keep, keep aware of stuff. That I think anybody can do, especially if they're a position of, of influence um, and, and have to vote on, 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 on policy and legislation. But again, you know, maybe that's a, a really naive view. But I mean, we're thinking now of having 
Well, there's two things we're doing. Um, we're doing the little book of EV myths, which will, will, will be a, a downloadable or a, a hard copy that we can give to press and politicians and public to talk about, you know, it clearly show that the, 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 these things are wrong. But I'm also looking at, you know, a drop-in thing at, at, at the House of Parliament or the, the Portcullis House where MPs can come and just listen to us and, and maybe Robert and I could do it um, and, and say, look, everything you ever wanted to know about EVs and electrification and renewables and heat pumps, you know, ask because we can give you the, the, the unvarnished truth. Um, but it's, it's an, and it took, you know, you, you've got so many MPs, how do you educate them all? How do you, how do you keep them informed? They really should be a government kind of, oh, I don't know, portal where this sort of stuff is easily acceptable. And there was, wasn't there in the, in the, in the latest um, Department for Transport Matrix Charter that they were going to deal with misinformation, but we haven't really heard or, or seen any, anything concrete from them. So it's, again, it's a huge job. It's like, you know, drawing up laws against the sea. Um, because you, you'll always find somebody who somewhere, I mean, there was another guy, uh, an MP who, who was on Sky, um, being interviewed and said, well, my constituents don't want to buy a car that needs a new battery every three, four years. And it's plainly not true. You know, we're not seeing battery degradation or battery failures at anything like the levels that people predicted back in, 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 in the early 2010. Some Teslas have, have got Tesla taxis on their same battery packs at 400,000 miles. And it's, it's quite routine for a, a, an EV battery to last for 250, 300,000 miles without significant degradation. So to hear that on, on you know, a national broadcast news channel, you've got to call him out. And I, I called him out on social media and he, he wasn't pleased at all. But check your facts. Make sure what you're saying is absolutely 100% accurate. Otherwise, you will look foolish. Claire, what is the big objective you see for Stop Burden Stuff that will have a, an impact for next year? Are you looking at raising awareness of the organisation? Are you looking at getting more experts involved to debunk some of the crap that we hear? Or is it something else? Yes. Uh, yes. So there's several things going on. Um, yes, we want to raise more awareness. So we've got some events planned. Um, we're hoping to be uh, uh, to hold an event at Holyrood. Um, in uh, January or February next year, we are um, looking at across the pond as well, um, perhaps with the, the events that are happening with Donald Trump and co, that uh, we may uh, look to do something um, over in Washington as well. We are putting together a myth busting website. So we'll have resources on there, a directory of experts so that uh, people like the media can come and find the information they need in addition to what uh, Quentin was talking about with Little Book of EV Myths. I, I think we really just want to get the word out there. So we're also looking at doing some industry roundtable events as well to get other organisations in the sector involved and amplify our voice. We are, I think, uh, most people... Uh, who work with Stop Burning Stuff, no, we're David against Goliath. We are really small fry compared to the huge organisations we're up against with um, their big teams and deep pockets. So I think it's really important to make the, make the most of our networks, amplify our message and get the truth out there. Contentious question here. It's not meant to be that way, but um, I'll ask it anyway. Do you feel you're making a difference or is it just a Sisyphean effort where, you know, you're pushing that rock up the hill, but it's not really making any progress. I, I think we are making a difference, but I think we could make a bigger difference. I think with more support, we could do more. So we are, you know, we're picking off the, <laughs> the worst offenders, I would say at the moment. And we're putting a lot of work into making sure that those that have influence have the right information. So I think we are making a difference, but as I say, um, with greater support um, and a wider network, we could do a huge amount more. Claire's, Claire's right. I mean, we, we are making a difference. And when you see where, where papers like The Guardian, who have really, really been extremely noble about this and, and turned themselves around and said, okay, look, there's, there's obviously a need for this information. Let's run a myth-busting series. And, and, and then, you know, the, the Express has... has, has shown interest in talking to us about getting it right. And we're having uh, lunch with, with somebody from the mail who I tore their ear off at an event 
about EVs. And he said, well, look, let, let, let's talk about it. So I feel that, you know, the amount of really, you know, unbelievably stupid anti-EV stories like the one about, you know, we're going to lose all our front gardens in Britain because of EV charging. That sort of thing is, is, is not so prevalent now. Um, so I think, you know, and I think the media know that we're watching them, that we are, we, 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 we're looking over this and just saying, hold on, that's wrong. And, and saying it quite loudly now, which is great. My one challenge, I think, is how do you engage people like ITV and the BBC, who seem to be singularly disinterested in talking about, you know, one of the most important um, energy transitions in the history of the world. And we can't get people like, you know, Good Morning Britain or BBC Breakfast engaged with us at all. And I, I just wonder why that is and why they're not interested. And, and, and when they do do pieces, they're, they're largely sceptical. So that's something, you know, we, we need to work on because clearly our messaging, messaging isn't right. But yeah, we have been making a, a lot of difference. And I appear on um, GB News quite a lot, which is great because it's a right wing car, uh, electric car hating audience. And, and for me to provide that counterpoint, I think is really important. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So what can we, the generic we in the public and the specific we, the people who are listening to this podcast, what can we do to help stop burning stuff? We, we most definitely need um, support. So the bigger we grow our community of supporters, the bigger our voice. The simple thing is to follow our social media channels and to share um, some of the things that we're talking about. But from a financial point of view, if people want to financially support Stop Burning Stuff, which is hugely needed at the moment to be able to grow this um, initiative, is to visit our Patreon website, um, which is patreon.com slash stop burning stuff. You can find out all about the work we're doing and find out about how you can support us further. Fantastic. I will put links to all that in the show notes. Um, I have one final question for Quentin that's not related to Stop Burning Stuff. So before I ask that, is there any final comment, statement or whatever that you'd like to make um, with regards to Stop Burning Stuff? Well, let me just jump in, the, in here, Gary, and say, look, Claire's right, you know, support us however you can. But it's as simple as, you know, if you're on your social media and you see one of these more extreme nonsensical myths pop up, just deal with it. Say, look, that's not true. Um, I, I put a thing in about um, um, tire wear on LinkedIn. You know, what's your tire wear on your EV like? And loads of people said it's exactly the same as my ice or um, actually lasting even longer. And, and, you know, you got that snapshot of maybe 150 people saying, you know, I don't have a problem with tire wear on my electric car. And that's the sort of thing that really helps push back. And we can all do that. It's very, very easy to do. The EV community is now, what, 100 and, no, 1.5 million people in the UK drive plug-in cars. You know, we're a voice now. Yeah, absolutely. I'll echo that. I think, um, you know, we need as many advocates as we can to share the truth and uh, to get the facts out there. So sharing your experience as an EV driver is equally as important as supporting Stop Burning Stuff. Finally, Quentin, I couldn't get you on the show without asking you to put your Fair Charge UK hat on and talk to us about the campaign to drop VAT on public charging down to 5% from the current 20% level. What's, what's the status on that at the moment? Okay, well, we've got um, a letter uh, coming uh, to number ten, uh, number eleven, which which we're getting signatures on now, and it's it's really looking good. People like um, Auto Trader, Greenpeace, um, Autocar Magazine, Jaguar, Land Rover, Stellantis, Polestar, um, Eon, uh, the 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 electricity provider, um, loads of blue chip people, AA, RAC, and and we're getting this this body of a really quite informed blue chip companies who are saying, look, we, we have to do this. We, we have to stop it because it's a, a blockage. Do you think there'll be movement before a change in government or do we have to wait for a change in government for anything to happen? Well, I don't know because um, I was on a call with Eon yesterday who were very interesting in the sense that they think the VAT has been misapplied because there's this rule that, you know, it's a, it's a thousand kilowatt supply to a person in the regulations. I won't go into them because it's, it's mind numbing, but you know, nobody really takes a thousand kilowatts for their car. So would that qualify for goods and services or would it be domestic? So 
then there is a big legal loophole. And if, if the Treasury has been misapplying this, then it makes it really difficult for them. So we're going to be sort of talking to them and, and pointing this out and saying, we think it has been misapplied and, and you should take it off. And look, it's an easy win for the government. It, it, it's really, really good. It's the right thing to do because, you know, it, it's people who don't have driveways, who are, are having to charge entirely on, on public charges and pay so much that, that we think it's a, it, it's a no-brainer. So don't worry that that's, that that's pushing. Whether we do it before Christmas or after, I think it's very likely that we'll present the letter after. And it will be a, a full-on knocking on the door of number 11, photo call with everybody there, and let's make a big song and dance about it. Fantastic. I like the sound of that. Claire Cullen, Quentin Wilson, a great discussion. Maybe a little worrying at times, but I think that comes with the, uh, the nature of the business. Thanks for coming on the show to chat with me. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. Scotland's Orkney Islands will pilot two electric hydrofoil ferries that will commute between its outer islands in a three-year trial. The EF12 Escape Water Taxi will carry up to 12 passengers between Kirkwall, Orkney's main town on the mainland, and the inner north isles of Chapinsay, Rousay, Egglesay, and Wire. Could be weir, maybe wire, in a year-round daily service. The 12 metre long EF12 has a 52 nautical mile range at 24 and a half knots and a charge time of one hour. That's actually pretty impressive. The trial is expected to start in March 2024 and charging infrastructure is expected to be installed winter 2023. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by Zapmap, the go to app for EV drivers in the UK which helps that EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use with subscription plans for enhanced features such as using ZapMap in-car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at info at evmusings.com. I'm also on Twitter at Musings EV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've got an electric. Is available on Amazon worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So you've gone renewable is also available on Amazon for the same 99p and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at Musings EV with the words FUD busting. Hashtag if you know you know. Nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon. You know a few years back he was trying to get a barbecue started one bank holiday in the rain? Being the resourceful lad that he is, he realised a bit of lighter fluid in a match would be the best solution. The local fire brigade didn't look at it the same way though. I love to remind him about it. So that fire story's gone, if you'll pardon the pun, you know, blazing on. Thanks for listening. Bye.